in chapter 2, and we'll be looking at the world of the hypocrite. This is a message that I believe you'll want to hear. In addition to that, we will have with us the Harvest Baptist Church, Brother Scott Enzer, pastor of that fledgling church, and uh, they'll be coming to worship with us and to use our baptismal facilities for their service tonight. So you make your plans and be here, please. Verse 28, Luke 18. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said, Jesus said unto them, Verily or truly I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who will not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Now, I really would like to be able to stop there and preach to you on the reward that God says is ours when we are sacrificing for his kingdom. But the purpose of today, and of several weeks yet to come, is to bring a series of messages on the subject of the world beyond. In this course of messages, I'll be dealing with some things like what happens when a person dies. Will we know one another in heaven? What is it like for those who are in heaven? What is it like for those who miss heaven? We're going to deal with some questions about demonic powers that most people, I think, have questions about but uh, just never ask them. And so as we deal with the world beyond, I trust that God will speak to your heart as well as to mine. Notice that he says that you will receive reward in this time and in the world to come life everlasting. So I guess it begs to ask, is there anything beyond this day? We're living in a world where there are many skeptics and many agnostics and many atheists who say that what we are about is just a waste of time and effort and money. For the atheist says, there is nothing beyond this day. They say that they are atheists. Comes from a, two Greek words, ah meaning no, theos meaning God. So an atheist is somebody who says, there is no God. And since there is no God, the universe is just a, a uh, product of chance. And that whatever we have here is nothing more than just some scientific mystery. And that we are all a product of an evolutionary process. And all we are, whether we be animal, vegetable, or some other matter, that at the end of our usefulness, at the end of our life, that's it. And we're done for. Well, the only thing wrong with that is, it ain't right. <laughs> if there is nothing else beyond this time, why in the world do some folks spend so much money trying to fix up this old thing that they call their body? If there is nothing beyond this time, why don't you just look around and whatever you want, just take it. If there is nothing beyond this time, and if there is no other world, why in the world are they still putting up tombstones in cemeteries? I mean, after all, if it's nothing, and you're done with it, and that's it, why waste all that time and effort? But they know deep down in their heart that there is something more and that there is another world. And Jesus says it very plainly when he says that there is a world to come. Now there are three Greek words in the New Testament that are translated world. 
The first one is Ion, A-I-O-N. And it, while translated world, it means that eternal world. It's that world that exists beyond this world, beyond this universe. It's that world that existed before there was a world. It's that world where God is, the ion. The second word, translated world, is the word cosmos. We're familiar with that. We hear it all the time used anymore. And it means the, the, uh, the ordered world, the created world, the inhabited world. So we talk about the cosmos, and we talk about where the birds fly, and we talk about outer space, and so all of this is a part of that created world. The third word, and this is not used often in the translation, but this is the word okimene, and it means the world system, the Greek, the Roman, the Jewish world. It was said, Paul did, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Meaning that he had his attention on the things of this life, on the bright lights and the loud music and wine and women and song. That was his thing, that he had forsaken the work and the people of God, for he was concerned just with this world. The Bible says to us that we are to come out from this world and we're to be a separated people, and we're to be holy unto God. And so the world we're talking about, this world beyond, is not this present world system, it's not even the cosmos that we see out and beyond us, but it's a world that exists beyond that. Here we have the world visual, we also have the world microscopic, and we have the world which is subatomic. But all of these are part of the created work, and the world beyond is the eternal world. As the Bible says in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word. Where is that beginning? I don't know. But before anything that existed came into existence, there was another world. God says it in the book of Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So everything that we see today existed only in a period of time, and yet before that came into existence, there was already a world, and it was the world that God lived in. And we can't explain that. I promise you I hadn't found anybody yet that can explain that. I certainly cannot with my finite understanding because I know everything that we are as man, we are limited by time. We can look back and see the past. We can talk about what's going on around us now. We can surmise what may be in the future. But our world is consumed with the rising and the setting of the sun, with the revolution of our planet around the sun, and we're limited in a finite way to what we know. But before anything was... God was still there. He was before anything. He is in everything. And there's coming a day when he'll be beyond when everything else is gone away. For he is God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word. The Logos. Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He is the source of the world beyond. Now let's talk about this world. May I first of all say to you that this world is a real world. Now it's real because it was created by God before the beginning. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 23, I am not of this world. Now if he's not of this world, then where is he? He's of that other world. He's of that world beyond. 
And so Jesus lives in the world that is existing now and has been forever and is going to be. It's a world beyond our capacity to understand. As a matter of fact, the Lord says, it hath not even entered into the mind of man the things that God hath laid up in store for them that love him. Now just think about it, folks. It hadn't entered into the mind of man. Have you ever tried to imagine what heaven is going to be like? I want you to know, folks, I'm willing to give up asphalt for golden streets, aren't you? I'm willing to give up a, a house for a mansion. I'm willing to give up the things of this old world where bodies hurt and wear out and lay down for a world where there's never any tiring and when the sun never goes down because the sun, the S-O-N, is the light of that land and where we'll be with him forever and forever and forever. It hadn't entered into the mind of man. I don't care how wild your imagination is. You can't even begin to touch the hem of the garment of what it's going to be like when we stand with God in that wonderful, wonderful place called glory. So it's a real world. And it's the world of God where God sits on the throne. Now you see, I know it's a real world because you can't have a throne without a world. And he rules over the throne or from the throne in glory. So here we have God the Father seated on the throne. God the Son seated by his side at the throne. And God the Holy Spirit making intercession before the throne. And so there is a real world out there that we are aware of. But now look at it because this world, not only is it a real world, but it's a spiritual world. Now as we look at this, my brothers and sisters, not only is it the home of God, but beyond this world there is a world that we call it, and actually there's two names. Number one is heaven. Now all of us like to talk about heaven. But you remember that old country song that said everybody talking about heaven ain't a going there because there's another place that's called hell. And that's just as much a part of the world beyond as heaven is. Now I know that in the average church today you're not supposed to use that word. I had professors that said you've got to be careful about how you preach about hell while you'll scare little children. Well, I've got a few adults. If I could scare them out of hell, I would. And are that out of them? Either one. I'm not sure which one I need to do. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that we need to be aware that there's a hell to shun. Amen. There is a hell that is eternal. Now, I want you to understand something today, folks. That hell was created by God just as heaven was created by God. Hell is a real place. As a matter of fact, the rich man that we're told about in the book of Luke is still in hell today crying out for a drop of water to cool his tongue. As far as I know, Pilate, who said, I wash my hands of the blood of this innocent man, is in hell and has been for 2,000 years and two million years from now he'll still be there. As far as I know Hitler is in hell and Stalin is in hell and all of the others who have said no to God's love walked under their feet the blood of Jesus Christ, said no to the Lord Jesus and said I'll not give you my life. They, when they die they go to hell and in hell my friend not only is there torment but there is no escape from that awful place. But I don't like to dwell on that. Oh, have mercy. I want everybody to go to heaven. I want everybody to get in on what God's got in glory. I want everybody to have that spiritual life in a spiritual world that God is prepared for us. Now, who lives in that spiritual world? Well, first of all, let's talk about heaven. In heaven, angels live there. Now, who are angels? Well, I don't know. I know three of them by name, though, uh, and we're going to talk about them. But all of the angels were created by God. They were all created at one time. Now, a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people think that little babies that die as babies, that they go off to heaven, they become little fat angels. No, that's not uh, Bible. 
Some people think that mamas become angels. No, that's not right either. When God created angels, he created all of them, and he created all of them at one time. God didn't start out and create a few and then decide that he needed a few more and create some more and then created some more. No, he created all of them. If you read the Bible, God created all the angels at one time. How many are they? I don't know. The Bible says that there's an innumerable company. The word is the word myriad. It means that it's a number that no man can count. They could not uh, express that in the Greek language, and they said that there were thousands times ten thousands and thousands of thousands. In other words, just keep stringing zeros after that thing, and there are more angels than you'll ever be able to count. And all of them were created as spiritual beings. They were created to minister, by the way, to the church. They are our servants. Did you know you've got slaves that will do whatever you need? And the problem problem is that most of the church don't know enough about what's going on to even allow the angels to come and minister to us. But in heaven, the angels, the Bible said, are always beholding the face of the Father. Now, they just get a hold of this. If you could see over in the glory today, the Bible says the angels of the little ones. That means all those little babies, boys and girls. That means all of these that are seated along here, these boys and girls. They've got an angel that's assigned to them, and they're standing there right attention before the throne of God beholding the face of the Father waiting for a command and a command from God is immediately carried out. They come to this earth and they minister to those. And by the way, I can take it beyond that because every one of God's children, those who have been born again, we are the little children that the angels are looking at the face of God, waiting for a command from God to come and minister to us in our time of need. Aren't you glad that God's ready to send angels to stand by your side, to bear you along, and to help you in your time of need? So in, in heaven, there are angels. Isaiah says in the sixth chapter of Isaiah that he looked into heaven and he saw them. He called them the cherubim. Now there are two courses of angels, the, the cherubs and the seraphs. But he said they were cherubim. And he said they had six wings. With two of their wings they hid their face because they're not worthy even to look upon the, the, eye, the face of the Lord God Almighty. They had, with two they covered their feet because it is so holy that their feet are not worthy to rest upon that land called glory. But with two they did fly. And their voices, Revelation tells us, is being lifted up like the sound of many waters, and they're crying continually, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. If you could break in on heaven right now, there'd be praise in God. There'd be songs of praise. There'd be words of praise because the worship never stops over in glory. They, did you know they never have a benediction in heaven? They had an invocation years ago but they've never had a benediction. There'll never be a day when the worship will not be going on in heaven. But over in hell, there are demons. Now, who are demons? Well, there are three archangels. There was Michael, there was Gabriel, and there was Lucifer. Michael and Gabriel are still there. You know Gabriel, he's the one that's going to blow the horn and call us all home. You remember that Michael was sent to fight with the devil while Gabriel were on a message down to Daniel. And so these are over two-thirds of the angels that God created. But there was another angel called Lucifer. He was the son of the morning. He was the angel of light. He is Nahash, the shining one, as Genesis describes him. And the Bible tells us that when God created Lucifer, he created him the most beautiful of all. His, his, glow, his presence was a, a wonder to look upon. There were musical instruments that were created in his body so that when he spoke, there was a melody of God. God that went out all over heaven. Can you imagine how wonderful it was when, 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 when Lucifer was faithful and before the throne and when he was leading the music there in glory. But then the Bible tells us that he, there was pride found in his heart. And he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm so beautiful. I'm so great. I'm so wonderful. 
You talk about an ego problem. Now this guy had one. You talk about an attitude. He had one. He said, I will put my throne above the throne of God. And I will say to the creator that he is to worship the creature. I'm going to be greater than God. And so God says, oh no, oh no. And he kicked him out of heaven. Now, if you read the book of Revelation chapter 13, you'll find that when he was kicked out, that great dragon as he's described there, that he drew with him a third of the stars in heaven. That's referring to the angels. And so a third of the angels fell when Satan fell. And now they are disembodied. They do not have the heavenly bodies that God created for them. They are living spirits and they are cast down into this earth and they torment people and they possess people's bodies and we have enough record in the Bible to help us to understand that if we'll just read it and know that all of them are evil and they are, they're called familiar spirits and people who deal with those familiar spirits uh, they are evil and we know though that there are some of those who are being held in chains under darkness the Bible says awaiting a day of judgment but the rest are those demonic powers that follow the command of Satan that harass the people of God that possess people who are not saved, who are behind the evil that there is going on in this world. And oh, what a shame it is for all of those who fall prey to the effects of those demonic spirits. Now, folks, I want you to know that if you'll just stop and look around you, it won't be long till you'll be able to see how that these demonic powers are making themselves known in our world today. I'll deal with that in another sermon. But there are spiritual beings and they are in the spiritual world. But there's another group that's in that spirit world. And they are the saints who have already died and gone on to be with God. Hallelujah. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl who has ever died either in their innocency or in their faith. I say innocency because if it's a child, they went to be with God. But if, they, uh, if they're an adult, if they've reached that age of accountability and in faith they have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know that it's just step out of this world into the real world. Out yonder where the Lord Jesus Christ is. And the Bible says that there in that land that every time somebody walks down the aisle and gives their heart to Jesus that they have a spell over in glory. The Bible says that there's rejoicing among the angels. Now that doesn't mean angels don't rejoice. That means angels are shouting and singing and ringing the bells of heaven and praising God for the Lamb is counted worthy to receive glory and honor and praise. But among the angels, who is that? There's grandma, grandpa, there's aunts and uncles and cousins and all those others in the world who have died in their faith and they're among the angels in glory. Their prayers, many of them, have been stopped up there in heaven. And one day an angel, that recording angel announces, Jim got saved today. And out yonder, Jim's mama jumps up, throws her arms up in the glory and says, Hallelujah, my boys come home. And all the other saints of God get caught up in the praising of the Lord. And the way folks are getting saved today from all parts of the world, can you imagine how much praise there must be going on over there in that land? I can see dads and mamas hugging. I can see brothers and sisters praising the Lord together because a loved one down on earth got saved. And it may be that here in this service today when the invitation is given, somebody's going to walk down the aisle and say I'm giving my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do it'll make news in glory and they'll get in on the praising of the Lord over in that land. There are angels and there are the saints who have already gone on to be with God. A place called glory. A little boy was contending with his teacher at school because she says that everything came about by evolution. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. Everything was created by the Lord. 
And then they got, he said, Did, let me tell you about Joshua, or, or about uh, Jonah, and how Jonah was swallowed by the whale. And the teacher said, oh no, that couldn't happen. That didn't happen. Why, we know today, in our scientific world, that a whale's throat is much too small to swallow a man. Why, they eat just plankton. They don't eat big things. And, and so a whale could not have swallowed Jonah. He said, oh, yes, he did. And, uh, and when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him about it. And the teacher said, well, when you get to heaven, what if Jonah ain't there? He said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> It's a world beyond. It's a world called glory. It's a world called heaven. And all of us who love God are going there. Now let me hasten. Getting ready for the world. The old song says, I'm getting ready to leave this world. Getting ready for the gates of pearl. Well, if you're going to get ready, what does that mean? Now, let, by the way, let me just stop and say, if you're going to hell, you don't have to do anything to get ready. You're already ready. Because the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you're here today and you've never invited Jesus in your heart, you're headed to hell just like a Martin is headed for a gourd. I mean, you're, the, you're headed there, you're a heartbeat out of hell. That's all. Your heart stops beating and it's hell, oh hell. hell. You're headed there. There's no in-between, no stopping off, no place to sort of get ready, no time to come back and hope you're going to get another chance. It's just die and go to hell. And the rich man, the Bible said, died and in hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And so there are a lot of folks that are going to hell. But I want to tell you what, if you're going to heaven, you have to get ready. Now, how do you do that? Well, you have to accept citizenship into that new world. We have at least one person in our auditorium today who is not native-born American, but she is a naturalized citizen. She had to accept citizenship in order to become a citizen of this country. But she's just as much an American today as you are if you were born here because she accepted citizenship. Now, folks, listen to me. God says that he is offering citizenship in the kingdom of glory to every person who will accept it. But you have to accept it. There has to be a time in your life when you confess, Lord, I have sinned. I've come short of your glory. I deserve hell. But God, I'm pleading for mercy. You have to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he died on the cross, that God raised him out of the grave. You, in faith, believe that what Jesus did on the cross he did for the payment of your sin and he was raised for your salvation and then you say Lord come into my heart now you may not say exactly those words but friend the day you confess your sins the day you open your life the day you receive Jesus into your heart the Bible says you are born again what that means is that over in glory Jesus reaches over he takes the blood and he covers the record that was written against you of all of your sins so that they'll never be called to your account again. And another strong angel dips a golden pen over into the blood of Jesus and writes your name down in the Lamb's book of life. I want to tell you what folks, when the angels sing your praises, they may not anybody down here know you, but I'm glad I'm known in glory. I've got a home in glory land that out shines the sun. Now folks, I want to tell you, you have to get ready in order to go to heaven. Now there's one other thing I need to say there. I'm on my way to glory, but I want to take something with me when I go to glory. Amen. Well, what do I mean? Well, I want to take some other people with me for one thing. I'm not satisfied just to go by myself. I want everybody I can to get on this train and go with me to glory. But I want to do something else. The, you see, folks, I, there's an old country song. I don't agree with it. But that old country song, people sing it says, Lord, build me just a cabin in the corner of glory land. Hey, I want no cabin in glory. But I want you to know, 
I believe that the mansions that we have and the rewards that we receive will depend on the materials you send on ahead. Every prayer that you pray becomes a plank in the mansion that God's going to build. Every good deed that you perform is another nail that God's going to use in the construction. Every soul that you win to God, not only we are crowned to you, but can you imagine that those will adorn the, the entrance to the house that you're going to call home in glory forever and ever. And you'll be able to say as you and Jesus walk around just look Lord all of that all of that all of that is for your glory your honor and your praise. Now I know that I'm just sort of spiritualizing there folks but I'm going to tell you what it gives me great pleasure to believe that one day I'll be able to take those things that the mortician couldn't take away from me and I'll be able to bring them and lay them at the feet of the Lord and say this is for your glory and for your honor. Getting ready. Now how do you get ready? First of all give your heart to Jesus. Secondly you labor for the Lord. You're not saved by your works but your works will be evidence that you are saved. Thirdly and lastly there are three gates to this world beyond. Now the first one is the gate of prayer. Now listen folks, everybody that's saved comes through the gate of prayer. But all of us have the privilege, listen now, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit who lives within us makes groanings before the throne of grace which we cannot utter. The Bible says that because we've been saved that we can come into the presence of God. It says that we can come with boldness through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that every time I bow to pray, whether it's in the closet in my home, or if it's in my automobile as I drive, or if it's here in this auditorium, or here at the altar, or see any other place, when I bow and call the name of Jesus, I just step out of this world and I step over in the glory. I'm out of one place and looking into the face of the Father. And I'm able to stand there and talk with him and say Lord I just want to tell you my needs and I'm telling you folks one of the greatest things God ever gave to creation was he gave us the privilege to pray and it's an open door it's a gate to glory and we are able to come into his presence by the medium of prayer and I hope that you go to heaven every day that you visit with the father as you go through the medium of prayer the second gate to glory is the gate of death now listen, every time one of God's children dies, they go to glory. Did you hear that? Amen. They go to glory. Now there are some folks who've got things all confused today. There's one major denomination that invented a place called purgatory because they said that folks have got to stop off there and be cleansed of their sins. <laughs> My sins were cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ when I bowed yonder at Calvary. I don't have to go somewhere and pay for them. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And I want to tell you what. When I die, I am headed to glory. Listen to it. Lazarus who laid at the rich man's gate died. And the angels came and bore him into the presence of the Father. I want you to know, folks, that when, when a saint of God dies, you ought to be real still. See if you can hear the sounds of angels' wings as they swoop down and take that precious soul and with speed unimaginable to man that they make that journey back to God where they, that one will be with the Lord forever and forever. Now I want you to know I've stood with folks who have died in faith and gone to be with God and it's always a blessing. When my own family, my own parents died, we had been standing around my dad's bedside for about three days and we sang to each other and we read scripture to one another and we were holding hands, some of us around the bed singing, God is so good when God swooped down and took him home to be with him. 
when mama died we had been there and I went and I was kneeling holding her hand as I prayed and I said God we loved her down here did all that we could for her now Lord we're transferring her spirit into the presence of God and God just came and took them on home to be with him old R.G. Lee great preacher that he was was laying on his bed had been in a coma for a while some of the greatest preachers in America had come to be with him and to be with his wife during the time of his passing. As they stood around the bed, that man who had been unable to speak or do anything for days suddenly raised up on one elbow and pointed toward the top of the door and he said, why, there's mama, there's daddy, there's Lena, that was his sister. And he said, oh, there's Jesus and laid down and went on to be with God. I want to tell you what, dying in faith, death is not anything to fear. You just say, glory, I'm going out of this life and going on to be with God. But now I'm going to tell you, dying without God is a fearful thing. Have you been there with them? If you didn't have so many people getting drugs today that keep their minds numb so that they didn't know what was going on, there'd be a whole lot more screaming and crying on because crying and going on because before the body even releases the soul sometime people can see what's over on the other side but then they can see what's down below too and they'll feel the flames licking at their feet and they'll uh, feel the chill of demonic powers that come to drag them off to hell and I'm telling you that anybody that's lost you need to get saved anybody you know that's lost you need to try to get them to God because you don't want them to miss heaven and go to hell. Well, there's one last door, and I mentioned it, and I'm through. There's the door of the rapture. You see, the Bible tells us Jesus is coming back again for his own. And those of us who live in faith and understand scripture, man, we're looking for him today. It might be today. We're listening for the sound of the trumpet. We're waiting for the day when the Lord is going to come and take us out of this old world and take us home to be with him forever and forever. And oh, that it would be today. Now listen, friend, when he comes, all these old things in this world that are bothering you, holding you down, giving you trouble, trouble, they're going to be left behind. We're going home. The word rapture means to like a, a bird catching away its prey. It's like an eagle swooping down and taking up its prey. And one day the Lord's going to say to Gabriel, blow the horn. And when he blows that horn, there's going to be a shout. The Holy Spirit of God is going to go out. The, the angel is going to shout in glory and Jesus himself is going to sin and as he does from all over the world everybody that has died in faith is going to come out of the ground and all of us who are alive and remain are going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air the rapture being caught up caught up to be with Jesus and it might be today I'm looking for a city. Amen. A pearly white city coming down from the Father above. I'm glad that it's not just this and that's the end but it's all of this and heaven too. God's so good and I bless him for what he gives us. Let's pray. Now, gracious Father, in this congregation today, you have brought people here to be encouraged. And all of us who love you ought to leave this place shouting because we've been in the presence of God. And Lord, because we've got a home on the other side. But if there be those here today, and no doubt, Lord, in this congregation, there are some who have never trusted Christ as their Savior.